Fraxinus excelsior, the ash tree. It grows in the temperate and subtropical regions of the Northern Hemisphere. Here in Britain, ash is the third most common broadleaf tree, with oak and birch being the only ones more common. One of the most impressive things about the common ash tree is its ability to self-propagate. It is the largest single contributor to natural regeneration in the broadleaf woodlands of Britain. In winter, it's most easily identified by its black buds. Single stem ash trees can live up to 200 years, but if coppiced on a regular cycle, the life of an ash tree can extend to up to 400 years. During the Middle Ages, ash was famously used to make arrow shafts and joists and beams for building houses. In modern times, it is excellent for tool handles, furniture making, spoons, bowls, and much more. It is an incredibly diverse wood, and so my journey into woodland management has now left me at a crossroads. The giant ash tree that blew down in a storm a few years ago. Do I leave it where it fell, or do I create something from it? I had many battles in my mind about what to do. Managing a woodland is new to me, and each decision I make will always have an impact on the woodland. Not necessarily a bad impact, but one that will change the way the woodland might look and function in the future. After leaving the ash tree in the woods for a few months, I decided that it was too good a tree to just leave to rot. And so I began the task of planning what I could make from it. The fine thin twigs and small branches at the top of the tree would make an excellent wildlife habitat for birds and small mammals when stacked in brash piles. The slightly larger branches have been high and dry for a few years now, and so they would make great firewood throughout the winter months. But this episode is all about the large main trunk of the tree. For this, I decided I would like to mill it into planks, for use in a number of different wooden projects that I have in mind. And so it was time to call in Ryan again, the tree surgeon who helped me fell the widow makers and dangerous trees in the previous episode. Right, so Ryan has done a couple of the oak trees and branches and that beech tree, and now we're on to the famous ash tree, which has had uh, caused a lot of debate on the channel of people who've uh, thrown in suggestions of what, you know, whether to keep it leaving there or whether to actually use it. We've decided it's certainly some straight wood and it would be a shame to kind of let that go to waste, especially as it's already off the ground. I feel like if it was already flat on the ground, then I'd argue, you know, leave it there for you know, yeah, biodiversity reasons leaving, and things yeah. like that. But whatever we do with this is going to be reused. And that's the whole point of what I want to do here with the woodland management side of it is to try and reuse as much as what ever comes down um, in any way, shape or form. So wh how would you attack this uh, this tree? What's Because I'm looking yeah. at it thinking, where on earth would it's you a start? Bit, a bit of a monster. So yeah, I think we're going to start probably from the base, just clear a bit of space, uh, give ourselves space to work um, and then just remove all of the bits that aren't sort of holding it up structurally um, and then as I say just get a bit of space enough for us to uh, to assess it a bit more sure. then I think we'll probably block some of the end up just so that that stump is uh, just supported and, and it's not going to roll anywhere and crush anybody uh, and then I think we'll probably then work from the from the tips back down um, take all of the the big branches off and maybe save some of the larger sections out of that potentially um, and then we'll get onto the main stem probably prop some of that up um, and then I think we'll just cut it back in, in certain sections yeah. that we're, we're potentially going to use it in. So while Ryan got to work on trimming and limbing the branches off the tip of the ash tree, myself and Dad started to create brash piles from the twigs and sticks. These will make excellent wildlife habitat for small birds and mammals. I already have a resident robin that makes a regular appearance in this particular area of the woods. It would be great to encourage a greater diversity of wildlife, and this is part of one of my objectives for managing this woodland. The slightly larger branches have been high off the ground for a good few years, and so these will make great firewood. I asked Ryan if he could cut these up into firewood sized sections, which he made quick work of. The great thing about having Ryan around meant that myself and my dad could get work done and so we formed a bit of a production line. Ryan would cut off segments of the ash tree, 
and we would then stack the rounds under the tarp so they could begin to season. Although, as they have been dry for a while, they have already seasoned a good amount. I then asked if Ryan could cut some slightly longer segments of the tree. These can be used to make something further down the line. What is interesting to see is that despite the fact the ash tree wiped out a number of hazel trees when it fell, there are still lots of hazel saplings which managed to continue to grow despite the damage to the larger hazel trees attached to the stool. The woodland is already beginning to adapt and flourish where the ash tree is no longer providing as much shade on the forest floor. Ryan explained that we needed to keep some of the offcuts that he had made to make a platform under the main trunk of the tree. This is so that when he cuts the trunk from the root system, the platform should help to support it and make it easier for him to mill into planks. At times, it was hard to watch this beautiful tree being cut up and processed. It sat so majestically where it had fallen, and it became a central feature in this area of the woods. However, I kept reminding myself what my ancestors might have seen in this wood, and even despite its death, it can be brought to life again in the form of usable and practical items for my woodland. Now that the majority of the tops of the branches had been removed, Ryan could focus on cutting the main trunk into sections. We laid down a number of larger logs underneath the trunk in the hope that once it had been cut, each section would fall down and sit on top of these logs and not directly on the ground. Ryan then cut the last remaining branches that were supporting the main trunk. It was impressive watching Ryan at work with the chainsaw. What he does is a dangerous job and even when cutting these supporting branches, you can clearly see the root and trunk of the tree lurch and jolt at the end of each cut. But it was clear Ryan felt confident in what he was doing. And he does this day in, day out. He knows which way the tree will move with each cut that he makes. I was glad to be further back filming this part of the tree cutting. That's, yeah, you can see that was worth doing. Yeah, definitely. Just stacking those. And actually, is it t it's touching ones down there as well, yeah, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, I think if, it, if we delay it, it would have gone straight over like that. I mean, when we cut, depending on where we cut that, we'll probably try and come maybe somewhere in there. Yeah. We'll be able to salvage a few slabs out of yeah. those because we just missed a split out or, or it will run out on the split. It was clear that the platform we had made was working. The trunk of the tree was already resting on it. And this gave Ryan room to work his chainsaw through the base of the trunk to separate it from the root system. What surprised me was how the root system just split apart as the final cut was made. And from looking at it from above, it was clear to see the damage that dieback had made to the lower part of the tree and roots. I must admit that part of me was happy that the root system fell and split the way that it did, because this still made such a majestic feature in the woods, and I will definitely be leaving the root system here to biodegrade and provide habitat for invertebrates and fungi in the future. What's it look like? Is it rotten or is it...? No, it's pretty good. It's got some splits in it. Well, it's got a split running that way and then a split running through that way. So that quarter has had a shake on it where it's come down and probably where yeah. the top has crashed and flexed it. And it's, and split it's just it. popped that, pop that in there. Oh yeah, yeah, I see that. Massive. But I think if I took... If I took a ring off and just cleaned that up, yeah. get rid of a little bit of the split here and some of the other bits, and then that'll give us a bit of space when we want to get in here with the mill. Yeah, true, yeah. Because the mill's got to come out and up. Um, we would, we will be able to slide the boards back. Then then we'll just measure a length off, and then yeah. we'll see see how we get on with it. Some of these smaller ones, with like the likes of that, we can just roll yeah. if we want to. Yeah. Um, to get, I mean, that's not too bad. I'll probably, I'll come through here and I'll cut that off first. Um, nice and level, just to try and get, get a straight run at it. Really stuff. I will try to keep track of the progress of the natural breakdown of this root system over the years, so be sure to click the subscribe button and follow along on my Woodland Life series to see the decomposition of this trunk in a year's time. To finish off the day's work, Ryan then cut the main trunk of the ash tree into three sections of around eight feet long. It was a busy day. But as always, 
Being outdoors is enjoyable, and working amongst nature never really feels like work. Already, this part of my woodland is looking so different, with the ash tree having been reduced and processed into smaller parts. I'm excited to now see the various species of ground flora that will now flourish with the newly acquired sunlight that they will be getting throughout the year. Fast forward a few weeks later, and Ryan was back, this time with a much larger chainsaw, a ladder, and a steel frame which is used to house the chainsaw. Essentially, he had rigged up a portable chainsaw mill. This is far more cost effective than dragging a full blown sawmill into the woods, and although a proper sawmill will be faster and more efficient at turning the ash tree into planks, this method is much less damaging to the environment. The ladder basically just enables us to get the first set cut. Um, there are different um, things that come with the, the mill setup uh, that you can buy, but a crude ladder works just as well um, to set up. And basically the, the frame runs along the top of the ladder um, and then that basically cuts a, a nice straight, a straight sort of line. And then we take that half slab off um, and then uh, and then we can run the frame off of the last cut and, and run the uh, the depth to whatever thickness we want. Your first height is set so that it doesn't hit the screws in the ladder. Yeah. So you kind and of I, overcut deep I just to be safe. I always overcook it because I've hit the screws before. <laughs> <laughs> and then how long would the repair be on the chain? So you'd have to get uh, I mean, that's a 42 inch bar. So probably about 84 inches roughly of chain to sharpen. So, oh, wow. And you've got a cutter every inch and a bit. So there's a fair old few cutters, so probably, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes to get a decent sharpen on it. Um, and depending on how bad the damage is, will depend on how far you have to take the cutters back. Is that a tensioning, what's that device there? That... So this, this potentially will come in later on if we've got the room to use it. Um, basically what that is, because it's quite hard pushing the saw through, this is just a ratchet, so that bit goes down the end and clips on the, the piece of wood and then that's just got a little round pulley bit on it and then this wire goes or this um, bit of string goes all the way up <coughs> hooks onto that and then I can keep my hand on the throttle and then I can just pull uh, the saw through nice and straight through the cut that's clever um, but we'll see see how far we get as to whether we're going to use that later or not um, I would have thought so once we get that out of the way it'll probably be good pulling it through this yeah. log um, but yeah, if I can get to the ends, I'll probably use it. Ryan fueled up the chainsaw and ensured the steel frame was set so that the first cut would clear the depth of the screws that were holding the ladder onto the tree. He then showed me a number of small wooden wedges, which I used to wedge into the cut to help keep it open and prevent the chainsaw from getting pinched. I tapped these wedges in at both the end of the log and the sides of the log. We then did the same to the second large ash log, and then it was time for Ryan to set up the mill so that it will cut one inch planks of wood. Think, oh, it's a nice bit of bark. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not too bad. And that, as a tree, you think that's done, it's knackered. Yeah. But it's amazing, isn't it? How yeah. We've got some discoloration and stuff in there, but it's not that bad. That sort of. Is that see, part of the, the dye There's the moisture. In that middle, yeah. yeah, where it's wet there. Potentially, yeah. Lovely green. It's nice, isn't it? It's like the quarter sun bits on the edges of the bits I love. Changes towards the knots, like the branch obviously coming out here. Yeah. It's like contour lines on a map. Yeah, it's amazing. Once we get a bit lower down and into this bit, yeah. you'll see the um, interjection of where it all where it comes stuff, in. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Sure, so I'd say an inch, yeah, yeah. probably should be about because it's going to shrink a bit, will it? It's They'll in... shrink a little bit, yeah. I mean, it... they won't shrink in the depth though. In terms, really, the thing... they shrink. No, not massively. It's it will sort of it will probably shrink inwards, yeah, inwards wise yeah. rather than thickness wise. There'll be a little bit on the thickness, but it'll be more um, in and out. Um, sure. And sort of some of these will will cup a little bit and stuff. The, yeah. the wood with the rings, obviously, it'll always try and straighten. So as we come down, because we've got the rings that come around this way, this will probably try and cup upwards slightly. But you can also use that to your advantage when you're doing sort of um, whatever cladding and things like sure. that, if, if that's what we're going to use it for and yeah. stuff. But when we get a bit further down and the, the, the grain pattern evens out to some of it, there'll be 
a difference in how it behaves when it sort of dries a bit more. Okay. Um, Looks amazing, that grain. It's good, isn't it? Absolutely amazing, that. I think, we'll get more, I think this will get more colourful as you see. And you're saying this darker patch is obviously the wet patch, yeah, the, the, the wetter wet part of the wood. This is actually quite dry. Yeah, but you can see sort of already when we first cut it off it was a bit whiter yeah um, but where the air gets to it it starts to oxidize uh, and react with the wood and you can start seeing the pink hues come through and this has already developed into more of a color from yeah. when we first picked it off and that one's probably already you can see how that's changed yeah yeah it's way. amazing isn't it how fast that happens but yeah and it will you know as it's used outside and stuff it will change over over the seasons it will silver off and stuff as well so it's it's good watching that first plank being cut was a significant moment for me. The way the plank parted away from the main trunk made me realise that I was definitely doing the right thing. Milling the tree this way also means that each plank will have a live edge or wany edge. This means that on at least one of the edges of each plank, the bark will remain on. This gives the plank a much more natural and rustic look to it but it also serves as an acknowledgement to the tree that created it. So even though it is um, a hefty lump, they're still, <laughs> still manoeuvrable enough. I was going to say, look, yeah, you, you carried it all right. It's light enough to play about with. Words can't really describe the smell that was in the air once the chainsaw worked its way through the wood. It was distinctly sweet, almost fruity, this was to be the first of many planks that Ryan would be cutting throughout the day. And so we left him to it, and whilst he got to work on the other planks, along came Dad with his good old trusty pallet wood. Now for those that are new to the channel, my dad has a little bit of an obsession with pallet wood. Not necessarily because of the wood itself, but more because it was free. He collects them from various industrial estates with permission. In the UK, a lot of industrial companies are charged to take pallets away, so often they are happy to give them away to anyone who is willing to collect them. You see, my dad comes from a generation where nothing was wasted. He will always hoard items and reuse them decades later. He's pretty crafty with pallet wood too, and one of the most popular videos on my channel is a tiny cabin that we built entirely from recycled pallet wood. We even recycled the old nails. There is a link to this video in the description box below. If not, just type in TA Outdoors Pallet Cabin into YouTube and I'm sure you will find it. And so we use these pallet wood offcuts to stack the milled ash on top of each other. It's important to have a gap between each board as this will allow air to flow through it and it will help them to season faster. It also prevents any buildup of moisture which could encourage mould to grow which would eventually spread throughout the planks. The planks are also raised up on logs a good 12 inches off the ground so that any nearby rainfall doesn't splash up into them. And they are also under the cover of a tarp to keep off the majority of the rain. You can see just by looking at the planks that they are already fairly well seasoned and the majority of moisture that remains is in the heartwood. Basically what this is is where sort of the trees got include what we call included bark so at one point when this was a smaller tree this was a union of, of branches and basically what that means is the bark is in between there and it just creates a weak union but what you actually get is something quite interesting grain wise because the tree then molds around and it sort of uh, like sort of bandages itself back together by sort of piling in a load of un sort of really quick unorganized cells um, and then you get this this sort of mismatch of, of grain pattern within the, the unions and, and elsewhere. So sort of if you like we've cut through that obviously a branch that's come off of it. If you'd have done that in sort of like a, a tree surgery setting um, or say a, a limb had snapped off and so on and so forth and then the tree had grown much bigger over the years what you'd get is a what's called a, a compartmentalization um, and it's what we refer to as zone four which is the re the, the sort of protection the regrowth almost like the um the fixing natural fixing yeah uh, and that is just a, a mass of unorganized cells quickly just to just to plug the hole to heal it to of. heal it yeah, yeah. 
but within that you get like the burrs and stuff like that which is so sought after for yeah for carving sort of, and for things carving, yeah for, for sort of that reminds making. me of a burr type yeah pattern. it's it's pretty much what it is really um but this once you get into this sort of the heartwood this this type of ash that's sort of come it's almost this is what we sort of almost refer to as an olive ash type yeah. wood because it's very very um reminiscent of sort of olive wood in the mediterranean yeah i've got an olive wood chopping board and yeah, it's exactly similar, that. just to let people know we're basically halfway through over half just over halfway oh, yeah, through we'll quite over we get a little bit more out of that we might have to cut some of that to get it up out of the um out the dirt because the frame won't allow it to that's amazing anymore. you could almost have like thin bits off that and have a knife knife handle you oh, know yeah, like bushcraft sure. knives i can imagine yeah, an amazing sure. yeah yeah look at all this sawdust as well all of the stuff that goes through the uh, all the stuff that goes through the chipper at the yard is just sometimes it's amazing bit, um, and it's so like pink i yeah, always ash is almost so yeah one of the fresher cuts where i've been there but as soon as you sort of you can see when you you burst through it there the uh, the older stuff that's got the oxidization, yeah it's, pink. it's really pink underneath and the it's smell awesome. is awesome yeah it's real absolutely pink. awesome i was just saying to ryan that, that you, it's hard to describe it's like a sweet smell um but it's just it's so distinct and it's it's really nice isn't it yeah you just it as you're cutting through that wood you can just you, you almost smell it through yeah. more than the chainsaw smell. You yeah. smell oh, the yeah. actual you wood smell. You don't really smell the chainsaw. But it's a lovely, well. lovely smell. This well, I don't notice it. No, yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's like you can smell it in here in the uh, the sawdust. I know it look, look a bit of a weirdo sniffing sawdust in the woods, but that is, honestly, that is really nice, really nice smell to that. So, um, yeah, and these are the boards we've got over here. So we've gone for an inch thick here. Yeah? And obviously there's splits down them, but that doesn't matter because we can run off a plank anyway. It's so yeah. wide that yeah. we can run off a plank either Moving side of that if we need where to. It's, where it's fallen, it's obviously got some sort of a shake through it. Um, yeah, it's had some a... of it is going to have a lot of pressure and stuff built up with all of these big unions. So yeah. it's fairly characteristic. You're going to get some and pressure. Got it? Got it. Just break there, Doug. Wow, so close to your foot. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> After milling for most of the day, we decided to take a break from it and move on to something different. And so we went over to the oak tree, which was recently felled as it was dangerously propped up against another tree. And Ryan began work on cutting off a few semicircular four-foot sections. These will be used for projects later down the line. I also asked Ryan if he could cut me off some smaller sections for carving projects. After the majority of the day having the chainsaws running, we decided to take a break from the noise of the power tools and get a campfire going for some coffee and food. I'm laughing because he's got a superb shot of an absolutely burnt f <laughs> yeah, just, people, that is dad's sausage. I'm that. My wife's not here. Well, she's not as big as that. Yeah. Probably the same colour, though. Same though. <laughs> yeah, as you know, my dad doesn't really do cooking, folks. That is, uh, that's what he likes to call well done, is it? Yeah, that sausage. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Meant to be. It matches that sausage. <laughs> you have to draw it in a certain way apparently to actually draw it. It's a real technique to it. Yeah, like apparently there's only to, a few people in the country. You have to point, point them down and, and really draw Load them up. Shoulders. What, to bend it? Sort of yeah, thing. to get it to bend type thing. When they're real high poundage. But the different diameters, I think some of the uh, war bow bits are, are like, um, like 3 8 thick type oh, really? big. With half of the ash tree now milled up, the area we were working in was a stark contrast to what it was like at the beginning of the day. There was a significant amount of sawdust, which does make the site look a mess. However, this can be used for smoking food, and I will bag quite a large amount of this and take it home to use for storing any green wood carving projects to help prevent the rapid moisture loss and inevitable cracking as it seasons. There was also a large amount of brash 
still in the middle of the woodland. I wanted to do something about this, and so I decided that we could move the top branches and sticks from this pile, and begin to create a dead hedge on some of the boundaries of my woodland. In the distance, you might be able to spot a post and rail wood fence, which was put in by the forestry company before the woodland was sold into different plots. As much as I don't like the idea of a post and rail type fence in a woodland, I understand the necessity for it. So I figured that we could stack some of the brush up against this fence to help make it look more natural, whilst at the same time we would be creating a wildlife habitat for small birds to nest in. The particular woodland I own is part of a larger woodland, in which there are other woodland owners. I have already met a few of them, and they seem like very nice people. The borders of our woodlands are marked with spray paint on some of the trees. There is no fencing in between the woods, only a barbed wire fence on the boundary where the woodland meets the open field. And so I decided to create a natural border using some of the dead wood from the ash tree, again creating more of a natural looking hedge, which would accommodate small birds and mammals. And each time any trees and branches get blown down in storms, I can add the branches to the hedge and eventually all of it will decompose and give back to the forest. So we're just rounding off the day by using all the off cuttings basically from the ash tree which we did a couple of weeks ago, the tips of the branches, the small twigs and the sticks and any of the kind of really dead rotten logs. And all I'm doing is just creating a dead hedge, just using that dead wood along this border here. We have used a bit of old kind of deer fencing, sort of sheep fencing really, uh, just along the main track, just where you know people come up and walk on the main track and they wander into the woodlands, um, and then they end up. You know, it, it, I don't mind the walker obviously coming through the woodland, but it ends up creating new paths, and then more and more people follow those paths, and these paths end up going all the way through your woods. Uh, and it's just something that if you're a fellow woodland owner out there, or if you're looking to buy a woodland, it's just something to consider. You know that you might not think about is it. once it's, a, it's naturals for humans once they see a path that's easy to walk they'll always take that path and sometimes that can be a little bit destructive to certain areas of the woodland that you know you want to keep wild so the idea is to create a nice clear boundary but also not make it as man-made as a kind of picket fence so the wire fencing is actually really hard to see and it's big enough we've left gaps along it along the bottom for um, larger, slightly larger mammals like foxes, badgers and things like that. Deer will be able to clear over that no problem so they can come back and forward. So there's always going to be movement for animals to come in and out. The main thing is we've actually created a deadwood habitat. So all these branches and this brush, these offcuts from the ash is all built up in a dead hedge and that's going to create habitat for birds, small mammals and things like that. This will all get built up even more and then birds can nest in it in the spring foxes, badgers, they'll burrow underneath it and they'll create their own habitat there. So it's encouraging that habitat and it's also all rotting back for biodiversity and things like that. So here is our milled wood so far. Obviously we've done some other jobs as well and we've got that lovely live edge on it, that kind of wany edge. We went for a one inch thickness and I was just asking Ryan, what do we do? Obviously we've uh, left some air gaps with some pallet wood so that can dry, but you were saying about it's naturally gonna, gonna kind of bow anyway. Yeah, some of this will bow. Um with the with the growth rings on it they'll always try and straighten so where you've got sort of the the half round almost growth rings if you like they'll try and straighten out and cup upwards so you so quite a lot of these boards will get some natural cupping in them just from generally the way that they they go but some of the edges have quite a, a nice straight almost quarter sawn grain about them these little um, these little lines yeah, so going down nice sort of uniform grain that's all going in one direction uh, which means that the um, the boards will be sort of fairly stable on the edges, so potentially sort of ripping down the middle if they're too cupped. Yeah. And it will give two relatively flat boards to okay. um, to do something better with. And now we come to the end of the episode. The majestic ash tree has been milled up and is ready to be born again into something new. And whatever is made from it and kept here in the woods will over time begin to break down over many years it will all go back to the forest that it was once growing in. The circle of life of my ash tree. Many thanks to all of you who are tuning in to my Wooden Life series. I appreciate all of you who are joining along on the adventure 
and giving feedback in the comments. If you really enjoy this series, then feel free to subscribe and follow the video playlist link in the description below to keep up to date with all of the episodes as they come out. Stay tuned for the next episode, which will be out soon. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.